Happy Independence Day for all of my American viewers, although I do know there are a lot of you from all around the world that watch the channel, so wherever you are, I hope that you're having a wonderful day. This video is actually going to be a combination of two videos that Scott and I recorded together last July. I hope it blesses you, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week, however you intend on celebrating, and I just pray that um, you're able to reflect on the goodness of God and how he has been good to you and your family and look back what the psalm says of look back and remember what God has done for us. So I hope you enjoy these videos. Hey guys, a belated happy Independence Day. It's good to be in America. That's right. Praise God for it. We've been chatting quite a lot about understanding the times and we've been reading uh, a real great history book. Uh, sent to us by our friend. Melina, thank you. She sent us this book that she highly recommended, A True Story of South Africa, the history that you wouldn't hear from most yeah. public, what do you call it, educational yeah. sources. With that, it's both incredibly meaningful to read back on your history of your people. It's incredibly sad as well to see some of the stories and the tragedies and the hardships uh, that your people, that the people of your heritage uh, have gone through. And so it is in America with the recent celebrations of Independence Day. So many people will say happy 4th of July and that's not like a bad thing or anything, it's just what we've been programmed to say. It's like saying happy 25th of December. Or when you come to wish someone a happy birthday, you say, oh, happy 12th of July, happy 12th of April, you know, whatever your, your birthday is. Like, no, happy birthday, Merry Christmas, uh, happy Independence Day. Because it means something, it's meaningful. Um, Independence Day is a celebration of the War of Independence that the colonies fought with Britain. And it's a very important history of your people, if that is a part of your people. Whatever your people group is, you will have special history. You will have special dates. You will have special remembrances and festivals for your people. And praise God, it's very important. The Bible says to not remove the old boundary stones set by your forefathers, to remember the good things that the Lord has done for your forefathers, for the people who went before you. We are to call to remembrance, we're to honor the heritage that we have come from. And that heritage will have special dates, special commemorations, special thanks that we give to God for his faithfulness to our people in the past. Mm -hmm. And so it comes to today, again, whatever your people group, wherever you are in, in the world, we are going through a certain time. It says of the children of Issachar, one of the, the tribes in Israel, that they understood the times and that they knew what Israel ought to do with those times. A friend once told me a while back, knowledge is understanding what's in front of you. Wisdom is understanding what God wants you to do with what's in front of you. And so we often have knowledge problems or we have wisdom problems. But there's a third aspect in there, which is obedience or faithfulness. We want to be called a faithful servant. Faithfulness is doing what God wants us to do with what's in front of us. And so I just wanted to chat a little bit about our times where we are today. We are in strange times. It's not unique. This has happened before. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new underneath the sun. And there's that famous quote of, you know, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. And so we've seen these cycles of history. If you read back over history, that's why it's so important to read history, especially the history of your people. These things repeat, these themes repeat. It's the history of, of the Bible as well. You know, you're reading the history of a people group and all of the themes and the times of how God leads a people through certain things. And there's times of obedience and there's times of disobedience. There's times of captivity and there's times of sovereignty. And so in Jeremiah 29, it's a time of captivity for this people group. And it's something we've spoken about in the past with especially the Anglosphere, the English speaking countries of the world. We think that they are our countries. We think that these are our people, our government, they, they have our best interests at heart. But actually when, when you start to read in Jeremiah, it's a very similar situation to where we find ourselves in the Anglosphere. We are a captive people. We are captive to governments that don't serve our best interests. We're captive to institutions that are hostile toward us and are against us. And so what do you do with those times, right? It's, it's right understanding. It's knowledge of the times. Do you understand what's going on in front of you? And so many people don't. We're deceived, right? We, we think that everything's happy. Everything's carrying on as normal. You know, in fact, this is the enlightened time. This is the great, greatest time in history and everything's wonderful. But that's not the fruit that is around us. The fruit that is around us is brokenness, degeneration, immorality, 
depression, anxiety, drugs, murder, a breakdown of law and order, a breakdown of the family unit, economic fraud on a huge scale with inflation and fiat currencies, the impoverishment and punishment or enslavement, if you want to call it, of whole people groups and conflict and, you know, all of these these things that can get you really depressed, right? We're not depressed because we're not victims, we're not victims <laughs> number one. And we understand that all of these things are cycles of time, that God will lead us through these things, just like he led uh, people in the past, our own, our own people. You, 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 you can, there's incredible sadness when reading the history of your people, but there's also incredible encouragement of like, wow, they lived through that. And here I am today as a result of that. That's amazing. And so Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah's message to a captive people. So what is a captive people? It's a people who don't have sovereignty. They don't have liberty. Having just celebrated Independence Day, one of the key deceptions is that we have these liberties. We have this sovereignty of our people. And to a certain extent, yes, you know, when you look, uh, it's one of the reasons I'm so grateful to be in America as opposed to uh, South Africa or what you've seen, you know, over the last couple of years in places like Australia or New Zealand or, you know, where there's just this ridiculous authoritarian uh, captivity. There still is a measure of sovereignty that is checking the desire for authoritarian enslavement. And so with that understanding, we've got to then go to scripture and say, okay, what are the scriptures to those people in that similar place that we are? Jeremiah 29. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Babylon's a, a very interesting concept with our globalist liberal utopia that we are all living in. You know, the Tower of Babel is this one unified project to unite all mankind and ascend and be our own authority, be our own God. And so we, we have that same spirit today with this globalist wanting to destroy the barriers of, of people groups, of tribes and tongues, and make one big tribe of all of humanity, one tribeless people group with humanity as our greatest achievement and no God but ourselves, uh, you know, all of that kind of thing. So it's interesting that that is where we have been taken captive too. I was thinking earlier, too, that's, I feel, what we've lost with our generation is not having a connection to mm -hmm. our ancestors and our people and our history. And even reading the story of the Boers, I can see how the Afrikaners in South Africa do have this belonging mm -hmm. and this unity with Rootedness. each other. Because they understand their history, they know mm -hmm. the history with each other. And they still celebrate their heritage days, you know, the days of importance and their their feast days, if you want to call it that. Yeah, whereas we in America, well, for me in America, the education system very much tries to get rid of that rooted belonging. Like I said in the my singleness video of socialism when I was in college, I was very much trained that America's bad, the history of America is bad, being patriotic is bad. And it makes you loathe your history and mm -hmm. where you came from. But then you start diving deep into your history. Mm -hmm. And it's like, these are my people. These are my ancestors that fought really hard to live the life that they lived. And for us to then teach the younger generations yeah. that history is so valuable. Yeah. And the other thing that they'll do as well is, you know, with the Afrikaners, I'm not an Afrikaner. I have... Afrikaner heritage, but I was raised English. So I was raised to venerate the history of my English ancestors. And so I never celebrated the Boer holidays. I bless my Boer brothers. You know, there's a lot of, of Afrikaners who, who I, I love and, and I bless and I honor. And so when they would hold their holy days, I would bless them and I would, uh, I would respect and enjoy that they are having a holy moment with their heritage and with their people. Um, but for me to take on their holy days and to take on their, and I, I suppose I could because I have some Afrikaans heritage somewhere mm -hmm. deep back there. And, and so I could, if I wanted to identify with that, but let's say I had no Afrikaner heritage, a, a way of Babylon, a way of globalizing these people out of having any meaningful connection with their past is to say, well, we're all Afrikaners now. And so we should all celebrate uh, the day of the vow, which is kind of like the Afrikaner 4th of July. 
the Afrikaner Independence Day is the 16th of December and to say, well, we should all celebrate the 16th of December. It's like, no, that's for that people group. It's their holiday. It's their holy day for their people, for their history. And then would you also say it loses its meaning? Because like, you don't know why you're celebrating exactly. that vow day mm -hmm. because that's not being and told. it's not for your people either. Yeah. And so the same thing has happened for Independence Day in America is that well, anyone can come to America and be American. And so we should all celebrate the 4th of July because it's for everyone. And so fireworks and American flags. But you don't know why. You don't know who and you don't know what for. And so that is the great globalizing of individual people groups into this tribeless, meaningless, uh, global unity. So thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who are carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. You know, you would think that the message to a captive people would be, rebel. You Stop know. getting married and having kids. Yes, don't have, oh, how could you have kids in this time? How could you get married in this time? It's like, no, it's the opposite, right? This is, the, this is a message to a captive people. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. You know, there's a great saying. It's like, only once you can dwell. Only once you can dwell can you build. I can't really remember the, the, the saying, but, but it's to the effect of, you know, you only plant a garden if you think you're going to be there a few seasons from now. You only build a house if you think you're going to be there a few seasons from now. It's a... It's a rooting of, okay, we're going to be here for a while. So let's build. Let's build something for our people. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands. Doesn't this sound like the Garden of Eden? You know, doesn't this sound like you are a people put into chaos, the chaos of the wilderness, and God has given you a mandate to take dominion? over the wilderness to take dominion over the earth and make a beautiful garden order righteousness law and that happens through family you know houses gardens husbands wives sons daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished you know that is the purpose of all war that is the purpose of all captivity and trying to destroy people groups is to destroy them from increasing from being fruitful and multiplying what is god's mandate to be fruitful and multiply and to disciple the nations what is Satan's mandate? To destroy people, to stop them from being fruitful, to stop them from multiplying, and to destroy the nations before they can be discipled. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. And so what brings peace? You know, the first peace is in our family. If we are out of alignment in, in your marriage between a husband and a wife, that is the first chaos, right? Again, Adam and Eve in the garden, that was the first chaos, the first sin. It was a laying down of the first authority, the first mandate of Adam's role as a husband. And so in all of this, the understanding of the times is also the understanding of what does God want us to do with the times. And for so many people, and it's a wonderful, you know, it's all out of right motive, right? Our motive is we want to please the Lord. Our motive is we want the freedom of our people. And so we go and do a whole bunch of things which the Lord is not calling us to do. For instance, caring about politics and caring about the news and caring about the popular culture and keeping up with appearances and all this kind of stuff. When God is asking us to first go back to the garden, to first go back to Adam and Eve and sort that out, sort out the first sin of our heritage, the first sin of our parents, sort out the marriage. Sort out building a house, planting a garden, bringing order and peace to what you can control. So many people always say to our videos when we talk about politics and stuff, well, do, don't you want to stay informed? And It's we've, important to be it's informed. It's important and you've got to be involved. And it's like, of course be involved. You can't ignore your own authorities of what you have control over in order to go and be angry about something that you have no control over. You should care very deeply about what's going on in your own household, your own neighborhood. You should care very deeply about what's going on in your own neighborhood. And so you need to be involved at your fractal level. Get involved in local politics. Get involved in state politics if you can do that. Praise God. Praise God for that. Go and do that. But the first things first where, again, understanding our times 
and this is unfortunately where the majority of people in our generation do not understand the times is that the family is the building block of anything that God wants to do on earth. Adam was alone. It's not good for man to be alone. He created him a helpmeet. So the first man who was with God at all times, he was, he had no lack. He had no sin. And God says, it's not good for him to be alone. The mission I have given him, he needs a helpmeet. So marriage is good. Then be fruitful and multiply. Children are a blessing. Children are good. They're part of your mission. They're part of your dominion mandate. You know, Abraham, he has all this wealth, all this land, all this power. And he says to God, he's like, God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And that is the, the root of our dominion mandate of our mission is family. Family is, you, you don't complete your mission on your own. You complete your mission as part of a family. And so that is what we need to understand in our times. Number one, for men, you are called to be a patriarch. You're called to build your house you're called to be productive and fruitful in your domain, whatever your gift is to give, to, to build status there. It says about Jesus that he grew in stature with God and man. And that was when he was working in his apprenticeship. It wasn't in ministry. He wasn't in ministry yet. He wasn't a pastor or a missionary. He was a carpenter. He was working a trade. He was working his skill set, his family business, whatever you want to read into that. But it says he grew in status with God and man while he was working. And so that's what we want to do. We want to be patriarchs. We want to build wealth, build influence in our family, our local area. And we want to increase and not diminish. That's an incredibly encouraging mandate. It's an incredibly encouraging game plan. Mm -hmm. The game plan is not go and be a martyr and go and struggle against powers that you cannot comprehend how powerful they are. And you're not going to go and as an individual defeat institutions. You need institutional power and institutions are built. First, the family, that's an institution. Churches are institutions. Bunches of families coming together and creating institutions to serve their interests. That's institutional power. It's not individuals, which is the libertarian conservative bent of like individualism, I'm an individual. As long as I've got me and my guns, then we're, we're going to be fine. It's like, well, that's not the truth because, you know, you're alone. You're going to get eaten eventually. In Proverbs, it says a wise man foresees danger and hides himself. Again, wisdom is knowing what God wants you to do with what's in front of you. And so you want to hide your family from danger. You want to hide your people from danger and you want to build strength hidden away from confrontation and doing that without fear mm -hmm. like fear mongering is not a good motivator you yeah. want to do things out of faith yeah. so understanding the times but not being motivated by fear mm -hmm. but being motivated by faith yeah because i think that's the problem with a lot of well like bill gates is doing this and yeah. they're doing this to our food and they're doing this it's is that provoking a response from fear yeah or is it well God is our protector. If God is for us, who can be against us? And so we will build apart from these things. Yeah, that's it. it. It's it's all about, you know, if you hear something from someone and you feel dread and fear and hopelessness, that's not helping you. You know, it's just, it's shutting you down. Why would you get married if it's all going to hell? Why would you have children if it's all going to hell? Why would you start a business if the economy is going to crash in? Why would you do anything if it's all just doom and gloom and we're not going to make it. But if on the other hand, there's an incredible positive vision of, you know, the Lord is with us. The Lord has seen this many, many times and has always laughed at those empires that have put themselves up against him. All we're asked to do is to be a faithful remnant, to be faithful that, you know, God is going to take us out. Even though we're in captivity, even though we our people are enslaved and we have no sovereignty, we have no liberty. Well, what can we do? Get married, build your households have children, start businesses. There's an incredible positive action of, I can become a patriarch. I can build a patriarchal life by hiding my people away from hostile institutions, hiding my people away from hostile empires with the hope that one day God will lift us up and will lead us out into our promised land. And along with that, I think that's why we hit on so much of helping younger people get married because understanding the times that we're in and wisdom for the times that we're in, it's not good for women to be in their 30s and being single or being in their 40s and being single. That's not for their best interest to put them in masculine positions of having to provide and protect 
for themselves. That's not what God made for them to do mm-hmm. because times are hard. Yeah. And so it's not good for women to have to be on their own. So that's why we yeah. emphasize the importance of helping Christians get married. Because that is victory, right? Getting married is going against the culture. It's going against the hostile institutions of this world. Mm -hmm. Every Christian couple that gets married and has a family and starts a business, praise God, that's you discipling your nation. That's you not giving in to defeat. That's you saying, no, there is a future for our people. And so we want to understand the times. For our young men, this is a time of captivity, of hostile institutions that are hostile towards them. They're not looking out for your best interest. And so you need to navigate the world not in a victimhood mindset, not with with nihilism and despair and victimhood. No, we live to a vision of, okay, I understand the times. I need to become a patriarch for the Lord. And it's going to be hard, but I have a mission. That gives meaning. I have a heritage uh, that I can honor and a destiny that I can build for. And it's the same with young ladies. You can't just send your ladies to the world thinking that the world is neutral or that the world is for their best interests of like oh yeah we'll send them to to university we'll she'll send them fine. to she'll be fine it's like no they want to destroy families they want to destroy nations and so by sending your daughters to them you are complicit in the destruction of families and nations whereas every single couple that gets married that has a desire to build their household build their economy a god ordered marriage many children praise god you're winning You're winning the cultural game. I just want to touch on the girls in university thing because I was talking to my mom about this. Ten years ago, we didn't know the fruit of whole high schools going into college. Mm -hmm. That was our times. That was normal. Everyone from your high school class all went to college. It was unusual for seniors to not go on college visits. Now, though, we are 12, 13, 14, 15 years out of that mainstream idea that everyone goes from high school to college. And now we can see the fruit of, is this a good idea? There is now data that shows, Mm -hmm. is this a good idea? Is this helpful? Is this working? Is this a neutral or positive institution toward our people? Yeah. And I would say even alone that it's even in consideration that the government will cancel student loan debts in itself is a glaringly red flag that this has been a massive problem that we've put all of these young people through university and they cannot pay off their student loans with the investment that they put in. That's the whole point. You go to university as an investment that will hopefully pay for itself. But instead it's a captivity. (laughs) We're not captive and bound to this loan debt. Yeah, that some people fear that they'll never be able to pay off. And so now we can see that it's not a good idea for everyone. Understand the times that we're in. May the heritage of your people be alive in your heart today. May you honor uh, and venerate your people and all the things that they've been through. I just encourage you, go find books about your people and not books that criticize and condemn your people, Mm. but books that honor and tell the stories of your forefathers, of, of the people who came before you. You want to celebrate them. And you know, so many people will be like, well, this is pride and this is taking pride in things that other people are. It's like, well, that's the whole story of the Bible. So you've got an issue with God, take it up with him. <laughs> so praise God, we should love our people and Amen. we should love our place. And so we want to be a, a forward part of carrying on our heritage. Don't let your heritage end with you. Praise God, God bless you guys. Today, we're gonna to talk more about worldview and how we view the world. Our current cultural worldview that we're brought up in through education and media has been very effective at making individuals who are cut off from their past and who have no hope for their future. And so what we want to encourage is a right understanding of history, your place in that history, and then the future. What are we building towards? What is our purpose? What has God made us to do? Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Russian writer, has a famous quote that says, if you want to destroy a people, you must first sever them from their roots. And so when you look at today's culture, how we're brought up, how we live, there's very seldom any connection to the past that has any meaning. Either we're just individuals who, you don't even know your own grandparents' names, you don't know how your family got to where you are. The culture is constantly this new, modern humanism of, you can go anywhere in the world, you can be anything you want, There's no constraints, there's no limits, everyone's equal. 
Your history doesn't matter. History doesn't matter. And sometimes it's the other side of like your history is evil, your history is bad, so you shouldn't associate with it. You should be feel you should feel guilty and despair. And then toward the future as well, there's all of this stuff that buffets you of oh climate crisis and political crisis and demographic crisis and cultural crisis, outrage, despair. And so people are like, how can you have babies in this? Yeah, why would you? You know, why to? would you? There's no hope for the future. Don't build anything. Don't build anything. <laughs> and so you get these people who are incredibly in the moment. There's nothing else. There's no past. There's no future. It's just seek pleasure for the moment. And that is the prevailing culture that we live in. We really have been working hard at reconnecting to our history, reconnecting to our heritage. Where did we come from? What is the origin and meaning morality and destiny belonging how do you fit into this whole long story of history and how do you honor your history because that comes from remembering your heritage mm -hmm. also maybe just because we're getting older the older you get then your grandparents start passing away mm -hmm. and then you start realizing wow like the older generation that is alive is passing away and all of their knowledge and memories and stories go with them. And so if you do have family members alive that you can talk to and write their stories down, I highly recommend doing that now because it's usually after death that you start thinking about these things of, man, I wish I would have asked them these questions. I wish we would have wrote things down mm -hmm. more. And so if you do have grandparents that are still alive that are willing and able to talk to you, uh, get out your phone and voice recorder and just record them while you're talking to them. Some of the ways that we've been trying to honor our heritage is we were really inspired by going to a friend's house and she was showing us around her house and throughout her house she had these beautiful frames of old photos. And so she would start telling us about her family and who they were in her family and what she knows about them. And it was so cool. It really inspired me with finding pictures from both of our mm -hmm heritage and actually printing them, yeah. figuring out who they are, finding beautiful frames for mm -hmm. them and putting them on display to honor our heritage of we have a really cool story of where yeah. we've come from. And feeling that connectedness. Yeah. You know, you're not just, oh, you were born, you go to school and now you're part of this generation. You're only this generation. It's like, no, we're part of something that is so far reaching. It was really cool. So Scott's mom, when we first got married, she bought us an ancestry package. Just recently, we got into it a few years ago, but just recently after my grandpa passed away, we got back into it again. And uh, you can like build your family tree and you can see just how big your family tree is and what's really cool is other people can enter stories of people so they're some of your family members the pictures were entered by other people who you're related to and we would have never seen mm -hmm. those pictures if it wasn't for that so that's been a really cool tool to connect us and connect links of missing mm -hmm. pieces of our family line and I think it's where you also get into the side of things of understanding how a functional family plays into being connected yeah. you know, because if there's broken families on your cousins and aunts and uncles sides like I never knew that side of the family because there was dysfunction there that prevented relationships and then seeing the joy as well of huge functional families 10 siblings had 10 children and now there's hundreds of cousins or yeah. you know it's like wow that that's amazing it's amazing to be related to all these people and then with that also food is something we've been getting mm -hmm. into with ancestral blood memory <laughs> don't go vegan people meat and potatoes finding recipes that are towards your heritage so i grew up eating geta and that is a german heritage food recently i wanted to figure out how to make geta from scratch because i was like i miss geta and we can't buy it where we are i found a recipe made it from scratch and it was so fun to actually figure out how to make it and then also i feel like it got like a glimpse into the lives of those people because it's obviously a food that's been used to stretch meat. It's basically like a sausage pancake type of thing. So it's meat and steel cut oats. And so the oats are obviously used to stretch the mm -hmm. meat portions and it's delicious. So that's been a really fun thing to yeah. explore and trying new recipes. And then mm -hmm. also then thinking, this is something cool that we get to carry down, Lord willing, to our children, then teach them these things. So that mm -hmm. way these traditions don't get lost. Yeah. 
And then another thing we've been doing is reading books about the general history of our people groups, of our heritage groups. There's so much guilt and condemnation around certain heritage groups and people groups. And if you just go through the culture, you, that's all you'll ingest is just the prevailing thoughts on why you should be ashamed. So we've decided to read books that are loving and respectful toward our heritage and our people. And that's been incredibly fun together. Whenever we're in the car, you'll read. Yes. Or we'll, after our morning coffee, we'll read a chapter of a book together. It's just picking historical books or biographical books about people of our general heritage, our general history. The next thing we've done is then to cut out anything that creates despair or nihilism or victimhood or guilt manipulation toward your heritage people and then toward your future. You know, it's the reason we don't listen to political shows or news is because what it's doing is making you outrage and despair about the future. You know, there's a lot of Christians who are, oh, just praying for the Lord to come back and they don't do anything. They don't build anything. They don't affect the world in any way because they're just hiding, waiting for their life to end. Whereas when the Israelites were taken captive in Babylon, one of the commands to them was build houses, get married, have children, plant gardens, plant gardens <laughs> increase, do not decrease. Seek the peace of the place that you live in. Praise God, what, a, what an exciting purpose, even if you feel that your world is terrible and you're captive. And the, it's like, well, there's still a very exciting thing that you can personally do. We look forward to building the future and being a part of our heritage's story on this earth. And we're, yeah, we're not just some random, like, plop here for this yeah moment in time but we're a part of a, a bigger picture mm -hmm. and especially that's even more real if you do have children like you mm -hmm. already have the heritage you see the next line and how you can then prepare and equip them like that is yeah. just so exciting and i think what's happened is our modern culture makes you want to believe that history started in 1945 until today history is just 80 years old. That's the whole of human history is the last 80 years. It's a short-sighted way of viewing the world and understanding how the world works. We're part of thousands of years of history. And so there's energy that comes by understanding your history and seeing yourself as a part of your history. It's a good thing to know your history, to enjoy your history, to reconnect yourself to your heritage. And then be a credit to your people with what you do in your life going forward. Be hopeful for the future. Be a hopeful part of your history for the future. God bless you guys.